I know Jay to be a person of deep faithfulness who follows his inner guide. In his short life, he has done many amazing things, things that you do when you act in holy obedience. Jay, in 2009, founded Climate Summer, a transformational program with student climate activists. In 2011, he co-founded Young Adult Friends Climate Working Group. In 2013, he, along with his co-defendant, Ken Ward, blocked a 40,000 ton coal barge with his lobster boat to prevent its delivery to the Brayton Point power plant. In an amazing turn of events, in the kind of opening only God can enter, their prosecuting attorney refused to prosecute them, saying that the government had not done enough to stop climate change. <clears throat> Most recently, Jay has helped to lead the faith-based pil pipeline pil pilgrimage, yeah. Uh, where people laid down in the trenches on the pipelines trying to stop the Roxbury pipelines. Jay is here today bringing us a message of being faithful in a time of cli climate crisis. I'm going to ask that we begin this um, in a spirit of worship in silence, and my words will rise out of that silence. Before we start that part, um, first, thank you um, for having me here. It's it's an honor and and quite. Um, Quite a thing to hear your words um, sung. I pray I may be a vessel in this time that may be of use. Um, I also wanted to just, by way of familiarizing with Quaker oddities, uh, introduce my friend uh, Aaron Noon, who is. Uh, serving as my prayerful accompaniment and my elder and for this weekend. Um, she'll be holding me and our gathering in prayer, praying for the opening in our hearts to let God's spirit in. Let us begin in, in a spirit of worship and silence. Friends, this is unlikely to be similar to what you might expect a keynote address to be. There is, um, first of all, a, a Quaker warning. Um, somebody actually made buttons that you would pin on your shirt at some point that said, in case of emergency, Quaker, I'm a Quaker. In case of emergency, be quiet. <laughs> um, this, what I'm bringing you today is not a speech, um, but I pray maybe a led ministry and in that process, there may be times where I am searching and listening for what is to be shared next. I invite you to enter that, those periods of silence with me. One other uh, note of tradition that, uh, or experience that I would in invite into this space 
um, is in my group of Quakers out in New England, um, we, we s talk about this concept of l not just speaking, not speaking in tongues, but listening in tongues. And I would invite you as I try to speak from the depth of my experience, which is coded in some way in the language of my tradition, that I would invite you to listen through what those words may be in their specifics to the underlying motion of the spirit behind them. And in doing so, find where your words, your language, your traditions may intersect. Or they may not. We can talk about that. I'm interested to hear. This also is an experiment um, in, the, in the truest sense, friends, we have not solved a problem like climate change before. I don't have an answer. Anyone who says they do is selling you something. What I do have and hope to bring today is my experience And that experience goes um, to what was mentioned earlier, and I want to start out with that, this idea of witness. For me, activism has given way to witness. And that witness is not some witness on climate change or some witness for peace. Quakers seem to have a history of doing, but is fundamentally a witness to the transformative power of God in our lives that makes the way out of no way, that makes the impossible possible, that holds out the possibility of hope in the darkest times. The witness that we have found, touched, and experienced that transforming, life-altering encounter with the divine, and are called in some way to share that in the world. I promise they won't always be so solemn. I'll try and lighten it up a little bit. So, um, gonna be kind of three sections. Gonna talk a little bit about how I see, um, from my perspective, how activism and secular activism and um, secular faith activism um, has been practiced. Um, gonna try and share my story out of that wilderness and into, through the lobster boat experience, um, the place where I am now, and then uh, try to share as well um, what I think the, the fruits and the possibilities of that approach may be. Often, um, when people approach the question of faith and activism or faith and climate work. We go back to the instructions or the histories in our tradition which inform how we should relate to each other, to the planet, to uh, creation. We have um, certainly lots of scholarship about how Christianity calls us to be stewards of the earth, not have dominion over it, how we are, are called to participate in creation. My argument here is not that any of that is bad, it's good and it's affirming, but that that in itself is not sufficient to meet the challenge of our time in history. 
My experience is that those words and those concepts fit nicely into our heads. We see them, we like them, we agree with them. It actually makes us feel good because our tradition says X, Y, or Z about how we should be stewards of the earth. But it's not sufficient because that head encounter, at least in my experience, isn't sufficient to get us to move into places of bold risk taking and to tread in places of fear to expand ourselves and our boundaries of what is comfortable. And that if we're going to be successful, whatever that means, <laughs> in this time of hopelessness, we're going to have to move into those scary places. When we look back at movements, social movements in US history, there's always seems to be a lot of Quakers hanging around um, in, often in positions of leadership, whether that was uh, the early abolition movement, whether that was um, in the, the suffrage movement, um, whether that was um, friend Baird Rustin in the civil rights movement. Peace movement. Why is that? My Quaker family, and I, I don't know how it is with your faith, but my Quaker family suffers from uh, what I think is our, we suffer from our legacy. Because we ride on that legacy, we look back and point to what those people did, and we somehow, through some magical thinking, get to claim as ours the risks and the pain and the suffering that they endured while maintaining, generally, comfortable, educated, white, middle-class lives in the most militant and powerful country on Earth. One of the founders of, of Quakerism, Margaret Fell, had her epiphany uh, in church when, when her, now her future husband and uh, Quaker preacher George Fox came and preached in that church and she heard the gospel in a way that she had never heard before because she heard in his speaking the living word, not the dead word in the book. And she said, we are all thieves because we have taken it as our own but known nothing of it in ourselves. This preamble here is the question, gets to the question of then what is, what is the it she's referring to? It goes as far as I can tell by many, many names. It moves through us. It is a power that we do not control. Some call it God. Some call it truth. Some call it the light. Some call it Christ. Among many, many others. My conviction is, at least as Quakers, if we are going to be powerful in the world on this issue, or any other issue that is burning as a crisis in our time in history, racism, colonialism, you name it, we have to find, rediscover our connection with that power, that spirit, that God. That's really hard for us, right? Because we are creatures of this empire. And at least my tradition is a tradition that comes out of a people rejecting empire. Whether that was Moses rejecting Pharaoh, whether that was Jesus rejecting the Romans, 
whether that was the early Quakers rejecting the king and the powers of the world in the revolutionary England in the 1650s. It leaves us in a very confused place because we are the empire. How are we supposed to live into revolutionary times when we are the empire? What are our faith traditions supposed to, how are our faith traditions going to speak to us when we are often affluent white people in the richest, most powerful, militaristic country in the world? And we benefit from those systems of oppression. Another way of saying that is how are we supposed to authentically act as people of faith in this time of crisis? How am I supposed to authentically act as a Quaker? My journey down this road started in 2006 when I, I read my first full book on climate change, which was Elizabeth Colbert's Field Notes to a Catastrophe. And I was working in Washington, D.C. at the time. Empire. <laughs> <laughs> Under the, I think, pretty arrogant idea that I and my thoughts could have some effect on the powers and principalities of the world by being in Washington and bringing my truth there. Ha, 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 ha. I was there actually to work um, on the issues around war and peace and on the Iraq war. But in reading her book, it became incredibly apparent, given my limited experience in Washington, that our political and economic systems are not set up to deal with a question of this existential magnitude. What a bummer. At the time, my response was to move back to my hometown, having read way too much Wendell Berry in a couple of years in DC, <laughs> and, uh, and to throw myself into grassroots climate action. Um, Lynn read the, the list of things. There were a lot of them. The biggest of which was this, this program called Climate Summer that was um, a intended to be a transformative summer experience for college students where they spent three months living out of their bicycle panniers in small groups, traveling from town to town in Massachusetts and later all of New England, um, sleeping on church floors or in basements as cavernous and cold as this, living on $5 a day, and stitching together the student movement with the, the, the grassroots kind of um, community climate movement and environmental movement. I was go, 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 go. Maybe some of you know this. There was not enough of me. There was not enough time. I cannot do it all, but I must push myself harder. I refuse to fail. We are failing. And therefore, I will do everything I can imagine. I will fry myself to a crisp because something needs to be done and I guess it's me because no one else seems to get it. I would note this down. This is one of the most important things we as people of faith have to bring to this movement because the secular climate movement believes that people power it is, is what will win this battle. I am not convinced of that. I believe it is God's power that can win this if we are vessels and channels of it. 
but that means that we have to put aside our ideas of being the heroes and the saviors in this fight to be faithful to what we're given. I burnt out on Climate Summer after the two years of organizing it. And two weeks before I was supposed to convene the second summer of training, I had to call a meeting with three of the folks that I've been working with and tell them that I could no longer do this work, that it had finally become clear that it was no longer mine to do. In Quakerism, um, we really kind of have a, a cycle, um, of maybe a cycle of faithfulness, I don't know. Make up some words for it to describe it, but the cycle is this. Stop. Wait. Pray. If you hear something that calls you, explore it and follow it. If you don't, rinse and repeat. <laughs> Stop. Wait. And pray. It's quite something to have um, to quit the, th the, the baby that you created and to lay that aside, to lay aside the ego embodied in having created a successful something, and to still be living with one's parents when at a dinner party, my a friend of mine who was my parents' age, who'd grown up with, who I'd grown up with, asked, you know, hey Jay, how's it going? What are you up to? And my mother from across the table says, oh, Jay, he's like that movie, Failure to Launch. It's not funny. But this, in my experience, is the pattern of faithfulness. If we are not that uncomfortable, if society is not judging us that harshly enough, whether that's society in the form of the police, or whether that's society in the form of our parents, or our children, then we might want to ask ourselves, am I being faithful or am I being comfortable? I am uh, fortunate that, that that nudge to move was given to me. That nudge was, move, was while it um, took many forms, including a kind of inward clarity that I didn't know what else to do except get in the way. Um, I kept trying to figure out how it was that I was going to make that manifest in the world, and the door kept being closed to me. Wait, pray, stop. Until one night, actually on the eve of Hurricane Sandy, we were doing a vigil out uh, in the downtown Boston to try and get Elizabeth Warren and her then opponent, Scott Brown, to talk about climate change in the debates, because lo and behold, do you have, you, actually, have you noticed? No one seems to talk about climate change in debates. Um, they, they didn't uh, then, but we were trying to vigil 24 hours a day, and, uh, and the irony of all ironies that as we were doing that, Hurricane Sandy was bearing down, and the wind was blowing, the rain was starting, and we were hunkered under tarps in downtown Boston trying to keep our little candle lanterns lit in the middle of the night. And my friend came, Ken Ward came with a big pot of, whoop, breaking things, big pot of uh, hot apple cider and said, Jay, I have an idea. Why don't we get a boat and go block the coal ship at Brayton Point, which is the largest single source of greenhouse gas emissions in New England. I'm not gonna talk much more about that story here. Shameless plug, buy the book. <laughs> All proceeds go to support the Climate Disobedience Center. Um, but in Quakerism, we have a term that says the way opened. Way opened. And what had been a painfully meticulous, ego-driven sense of what I was supposed to do on climate transformed itself into an easy way. Scripture says, the yoke is easy. 
I found that to be true, we bought a boat. We fixed it up. We got in the water. The guy who owned the boatyard told us we had to move it. We were still waiting for the coal barge to show up. It did, almost on time. And we motored out at 6 a.m. on a beautiful, cloudless day from Newport, Rhode Island to put ourselves in the path of that coal ship. And because, I am I'm convinced, because that action moved from the deepest well of my sense of conviction and my sense of I can't do anything but this. I don't know what else to do with my life but this, but I can at least lay my life here. That I was able to, and we were able to, both meet that barge, meet the enforcement officers, meet the Coast Guard, meet the police, and later, the state police. I think there were some other, other enforcement officials waiting in the wings, but, and later meet the prosecutor, the district attorney, and others with a sense of openness, love, forgiveness, if not joy, to the point where we were actually on the boat telling jokes with the cops. And they were showing us, the Coast Guard guys were showing us how to use our radar. <laughs> I am not here to claim that everyone has to get on the boat. I don't presume to know what your personal boat is. It is not that we all need to commit some acts of holy obedience or civil disobedience. But I'm convinced that God has allotted each of us our role. I'm guessing that that role is, if faithfully followed, not going to always be comfortable or easy. But that if we confront truthfully the desolating reality of what is before us, of a government and, let's say, a Paris Agreement that gets us nowhere near the speed and magnitude of changes we need in a world spinning out of control with crazy people running for president and reality being put to the sidelines, that if we are capable of encountering that desolating reevaluation of where we fit in the world and what our priorities are, and are capable of moving from that ego place, that I place, to that thy place, from my will to thy will, into the fullness of the love of God, we will find ourselves unafraid, bold, and able to manifest that transformation in the world. I want to finish, or, or move, I guess, in the end of this to a question of what, what would it look like for us to have a robust, faith-based movement on climate? Maybe moving here from the personal to the corporate to the body to us together. I spend a bit of time um, at the end of August at Standing Rock in North Dakota. And for the first time, encountered something that met my dream of what it could look like. And this is going to be a challenge for us who are white European American colonizers in the United States who live off of our privilege. Because we don't have a culture that isn't a culture of empire. 
Standing Rock was incredible because it was so fully native. Prayer, drumming, ceremony. What is it that I, as a Quaker, could imagine seeing Quakers do that was as fully Quaker as the encampment at Standing Rock is Sioux? What would it be to be as fully Presbyterian or whatever manifested in this world as it, would, as it is manifested at Standing Rock? Have, we had one experiment in my Quaker New England of that, which Lynn mentioned. The, yeah, two years ago, a year and a half ago, um, some friends led, initiated and led um, what we called the Pipeline Pilgrimage, where we walked uh, over 10 days, 150 miles, um, the length of a proposed Kinder Morgan high volume fracked gas pipeline that was to be built across New York, Massachusetts, and southern New Hampshire. We didn't carry signs. We didn't shout. We didn't have chants. We got up in the morning and we held worship together. We walked for some periods of time in silence. We shared our emotional experience of encountering the land, encountering the communities that we were passing through, meeting the abundant hospitality that opened its doors to us as we walked from town to town. We had reflection and Bible study in the evening. And we carried one banner that was in its Quaker way, simply a question. Climate change, an invitation to new life, That invitation to new life, in whatever the language is of your tradition, I think is our opportunity at this moment of hopelessness and crisis. For us to move from our headspace to our heart space, from our idea that we have control to, our, to a new idea, which is a very old idea, that if we faithfully listen and follow the guide, whatever name that is holds for you, we will come round right in exactly the place that we are supposed to be and be led to the work that is meant for us. I invite you as you continue to contemplate what a Faith Climate Action Organization or Coalition looks like, to contemplate what would it look like to fully inhabit your tradition. From my reading of the gospel in the Christian tradition and in the Quaker tradition, what it offers for us is not keys to stewardship, but the keys to unlocking that transform transformed reality in our hearts that moves us in ways to boldness, love, and risk. That risk, if we follow the pattern, at least in the Christian tradition, may be so opposed to the empire that oppresses that we end up on a cross. But that's not the whole story, right? From that cross, Jesus was so filled 
with God's love and with love for his fellow human beings. That he had compassion for those who were stringing him up. He had found a kingdom, translate as you need to, in this world that freed him and those who followed his way from fear, from the desire to dominate and oppress, from the need to have control, and ushered them into a a relation of peace, joy, forgiveness, I'd take that kingdom any day. I find, and this was my experience on the lobster boat, That when we are so full of the love of God, what pours through me and out of me is love. We don't need anything else. We don't need the external validation of the things our culture tells us will give us love or make us lovable. Whether that is being a badass radical activist or the perfect mother or father, wife, husband, partner, daughter or son. And that is what frees us to do the things that society tells us is risky. Because we know through our own lived experience that we are loved by something bigger, more important than us, and that there is nothing, even death, that can take that away. And what is the withdrawal of the affirmations of society or days in prison compared to that love? Dear God, I cannot do this without you. We cannot do this without you. We've never solved a problem like this before. Rouse us from our complacency and comfort. Fill us with that love that spills over Give us the boldness to manifest our transformation and your love into the world. Let us be your witnesses. Whether that is in the streets, the kayaks, on the railroad tracks, in the so-called halls of power, in our homes, our faith communities, in the kitchens, accompanying the sick, and caring for the homeless. May we make our lives in service to your justice. May we make our lives into that peace that passes understanding into that love that casts out fear. We know you tell us the yoke is easy, God. 
Help us know it in our hearts. I think we have some time for a conversation. And books. And books. No pressure. So, 10 minutes, what do we want to do? Five minutes? Uh, ten, ten minutes. Great. Um, I would invite, uh, if someone has a question, to stand and give it. And I am going to have to ask you to police yourselves because um, there may be more than one. could talk about that for a couple of hours. The question was, um, I, I talked about how uh, my encounter with the police is full of, was, was full of light for me. That is not an encounter that is shared by people of color often. And, and could I talk to about the intersection with racial justice and climate justice and perhaps pulling in Standing Rock? Um, I think what I'll say at this, in this time is that my tradition points to a relation to the world that invites suffering on ourselves. It may not be everyone's place to be in a place with, uh, where there are police. But that the root of that spiritual transformation that casts out fear is the same for climate as it is for those of us affluent white folk who need to get over the fact of our privilege and enter into a willingness in whatever way we can to lay it aside to suffer and, uh, and to put ourselves in that witness to new life and transformation. That's a super big answer. Um, I don't know how to go into more specifics without like an hour, but let's chat afterwards. Um, it's this, my view of it is that all of this sickness in our culture is from the same root. And that root is in 
pick your word, pick your terminology. Um, a lot of biblical scholars use the idea of the domination system, which arose during the agricultural revolution where there became city-states who warred against each other to build up assets and things and material wealth. And that the revolutions of several iterations of that tradition is to try and supplant that domination system, which seems to creep in. You know, Jesus died because of the empire. Then the empire is like, hmm, yoink, Jesus, we'll take that and use it as our own tool. And that, I think, is the state of Christianity in America, by and large, as a tool of the empire, which isn't how it was intended. But I have some faith that if we can get to the root of what that real faith is, we might enter a place where we no longer need to dominate and we no longer are fulfilled by our whiteness or our oppression or our greed because there's something else that fills us. Oh, so the question is, yeah, what, what is faith versus faithfulness spiritual or spiritual connection? connection? Love that question. <laughs> I want to back up and say, I am not a trained theologian. <laughs> My tradition was founded on making fun of trained theologians. <laughs> and going into their churches and interrupting them. <laughs> and then when those trained theologians and their lackeys in the government, or vice versa, were afraid of the power of the spirit that had entered those friends, who were worshiping in silence on the edge of town in the hundreds, that's pretty effing scary if you are the constable of Dover or whatever, and there's a couple hundred people in eerie silence worshiping, um, you go and throw them in prison. For me, faith is not a theological complex. but is a trust that my experience of what I call encounter with the divine is real and matters. And that faithfulness is the process by which I attempt to follow it. Not the faith, but that little voice. Or as the King James translation of Elijah says, that still small voice within. Or as Paul says, that inward Christ. Or as the Quaker said, the seed. Yeah. We got time for one more. Hi. 
get yourself in some holy trouble. (laughs) And we'll be there to support you. That's our job. The real thing is for you to find your way into that loving disobedience. Sorry. (laughs) Okay, there's one more then. Friend. Hmm. The question was to share some of my experience at Standing Rock. I think I kind of said this earlier, but my personal experience at Standing Rock, which I'm going to very much differentiate from what is going on at Standing Rock um, was grief that my people wouldn't know how to do their version of this. I, I (laughs) the only way I know how to describe it in my super white liberal New England experience is like, It was a combination of a folk festival with civil disobedience. It was like a folk festival planted in the middle of a pipeline. And what I mean by that is not to demean what was going on there, but but my only encounter with that depth of community in my experience is from like my folk festival community where we're like dancing and singing and loving together. That spirit is embodied everywhere in those encampments. I pluralize that because there's lots of complexity going on there for sure. But it oozed love. You know, walking up the hill to to get a view and take in the thing. Um, I was called over by, uh, by a family. Everyone's camped in their kind of extended families. Um, come on over, do you want to you want a Coke? Sit down. Where are you from? I, I'm from Vermont right now. That was a long way away. Why are you coming from Vermont? And what ensued was, you know, a good hour-long conversation that, that spanned from, um, from members of the, the Standing Rock tribe who lived, you know, 30, 40 minutes down the road and who were, were camped out a wide-ranging conversation that got right back down to the spiritual root of figuring out how we are to be living a different way in the face of corporate oppressive America. And the depth of analysis is widely shared. The clarity of their, their place is incredible. And, and obviously, for a good reason, having had that opposition from and, and genocide from white European Americans for centuries. Um, but I pray, friends, that we, in our own ways, find that sense of community, that sense of love, and that sense of togetherness and identity that stands in opposition to the world as it is, but has some firm rock upon which we can stand to weather the storm. Thank you for having me.